I gave a little cough then to indicate I was going to start. I hope you noticed. Um, well, I had my very great pleasure, my very great pleasure indeed, uh, to uh, in, be able to introduce uh, Jack Windsor uh, Lewis to you. Uh, Jack, like me, was born and brought up in uh, Cardiff, in uh, South Wales, and we now have a new colleague from, uh, from the very close to there, Paul Carley. Um, so we're in, all hoping to teach you educated Welsh English. So we'll, we'll have the sing-song lessons at the end, but I'll leave that to, to uh, Jack to do. Jack and I followed each other around. We, went, we were born in the same town. No, no, we, you follow me. I follow you too. <laughs> That's true. With an interval of, well, some years between us, went to the same place, we had a job at the same place, we went, uh, we went to the same university to get our first degrees, and we came to another university to, uh, uh, for, for uh, further training in a subject called phonetics and a little place called UCL. So we followed you another round and eventually... All that done equally and successfully. <laughs> and eventually, as you see, I followed him uh, on to uh, this uh, uh, step course here. Jack has taught all over the world, uh, in Iran, in Spain, Oslo, uh, Belgium, have I left any out, any other foreign countries? Oh, yeah. Yorkshire, that's right, Yorkshire, that's the other foreign country I was going to. Uh, he came uh, to Japan. <laughs> and he came to Japan as well, of course he did, absolutely too. Uh, but anyway, he's always kept up his association uh, with uh, UCL, and this is, the, uh, this is the ultimate, this is the last association uh, that he's been doing for many, many years. I just asked him how many years he's been doing this course for. Uh, 21 uh, consecutive years in this course. 21 consecutive years. In fact, that is a bit of a record. The only person I know who is done it equally consecutive is John Well. <laughs> right, well, that's quite something. Um, Jack, took a year off once, <laughs> Jack has contributed a, a great deal into uh, phonetics, an excellent uh, um, uh, uh, textbook in, uh, in uh, elementary phonetics for uh, non native students and published in Norway. Uh, an excellent uh, little dictionary. It's very nice to have little dictionaries. Uh, and the concise dictionary, which I honestly think is, is a, a, a very, very uh, notable piece of work. Um, countless reviews, several articles, many, many obituaries. I used to look up the JIPA, the Journal of the International Phonetic Association. If my death notice, written by Jack, wasn't there, I knew I could go to work for the rest of the day. <laughs> And his blog, of course, uh, is a constant uh, delight. And I think that we are very, very lucky to have somebody who is a leg end in his... Did I pronounce that right? A leg end? Uh, a book end, <laughs> A book end. <laughs> a legend in his own time is here to talk to us today. Jack, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. I'm glad he said to talk to you and not to lecture you, right? But this isn't a lecture, it's a talk. And uh, I say that uh, carefully and advisedly uh, because it's, it's not good to be a proper lecture, it's not going to be a proper talk. In fact, a little bit is going to be improper. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about some terribly naughty words. But I shan't tell you very clearly. I'll hint at it, right? So now I think we're going to. You can see my, uh, what I have to say, this is, a, I'm advertising today, right? <laughs> I'm advertising my website. And my web website is quite a big uh, undertaking. I calculated that sometime uh, before the end of the year or early next year, I've got to half a million words. I've only got to do another tenth of what, what I've done so far, or twentieth, and I'll get to half a million. So there's quite a lot on it. And there might be a lot of it on it that you find interesting. It won't always agree with everything it's said to you in the lectures here, but never mind. It will be stimulated to read, I hope. Now, that, that means I'm going to get off this page and we we'll go forward. Can we go forward? Oh, yeah, right. Right, good. Oh, no, there, there, it is in 4.25. Oh, yes, it mentioned your picture is, yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to doing, to doing uh, bread bears if you live long enough. <laughs> Many are true words spoken in jest. <laughs> oh yes, and my blogs have got up to 350. I've only been doing blogs uh, for 
slightly shorter time than I had a, a website. And uh, I did blog because um, you know Professor John Wells, who used to run this course, uh, <coughs> retired from it about five years ago, was it? And within a year or two, he was back doing blogs. And, I th and of course he was saying all sorts of things that I wanted to argue with him about. So I got very, very frustrated. And the only thing I could do was start a blog myself. <laughs> and I could argue with Africa. So that's how my blog started. Anyway, they got to up to Africa. Now, I'm nowhere near as many as he, he knows his count of how many he's written. Uh, but I recommend it to you to uh, put his name in. If you put either of our names in, you'll find our, in Google, I mean, you'll find our website. You don't have to make a note of the website uh, URL. You'll, you'll find it easily enough. But anyway, uh, he now um, has a, almost daily work. He, he, five days a week. He, he doesn't work on Saturdays and Sundays, which is a relief to all of us because <laughs> it's very difficult. Very difficult. And, uh, but they're all excellent. They're all well worth reading, especially if you can understand them. I can't read it. It's very good. So I recommend John's uh, blogs. And so a blog is a web blog. It's a log. It's a, a periodical note of things. So what I do in my blog, what he does in his, is something you don't do in a longer article or, or a book. Uh, you can publish in a small way, uh, in small doses. And that's easier for me to manage if I don't have to do too much at once. But I'm, I'm afraid I'm naturally born lazy. So <laughs> if I can think of something more pleasant to do, I don't do a blog. But, but, but then I like to. Right, we'll go on a little, please. And we'll see now, yeah, we'll go past that quickly, yes. Yes. Now, the first section in this thing is three, three or four appreciations of people. One is, is a complimentary piece about John Wells on his retirement, if you want, please. Another is about Daniel Jones, the founder of this department. Um, it's, uh, he was founded in about 1908, wasn't it? Okay, good. And, then now English language. Now that is not aimed particularly at EFL, at English or foreign language, or as I prefer to call it these days, I don't like the word foreign. But if you'd say, do you speak English as foreign language, you're treating the person as a foreigner. And I don't feel you're foreign as if I talk to you, I feel you're just other people. So I call it an extra language these days. Um, this is following roughly what uh, my good friend uh, Crockenden, Alan Crockenden, the man who sold splendidly took over Gibson's book. I'm sure you'll be hearing about Gibson's book and Crockenden's elaborations of it, uh, which I excellent recommend to you. Anyway, uh, this is not a particularly at the uh, English as an extra language word, but if that first item there might interest you a lot, particularly if you meet both American English and British English, because it happens to be the longest piece I know of published, which compares the two pronunciations. It only deals with pronunciation, but it goes into, uh, as far as I possibly can, as much as I know at the moment, about the differences and the resemblances between American, or I call it general American English, people do that, and, I, and the other kind, I don't use the term RP. I regard it as too old-fashioned, you know, a modern chap like me. I call it general British, right? But I mean RP, of course, you know. I just like my, word, my term better. So I recommend that to you if you're interested in, in the differences between American and British English. But then what follows it is bits and pieces that are not really aimed at the uh, extra language world. So it's all yeah. they're, they're sort of historical things like that. Keep going, please. Yeah. Keep going. Now, here we go. I, I could use the traditional term because I haven't decided that I wasn't going to call it that then, and I haven't changed it. <laughs> so I call, it's calling it in a foreign language. And uh, in that, in, we've got a number of things. The first item there, I will perhaps come back to, depends on what time we've got. But that, uh, that is um, the full text, more or less, of a book I published in, in 1977, with Oxford University Press, called People Speaking. And to do that, I got uh, several actors together in the studio and got them to record ordinary English everyday conversations. So, and they did very well, and I recommend you to listen. You can hear what, what they said for any 53 items in that book. 
the book is no longer available, and I'm glad it is because, you know, when I, as soon as I've written something, I don't like it any longer, I think I've improved on it. So I don't attempt to, I've never wanted to republish my Guide to English Pronunciation of 1969, for instance. But you'll find all the good things that I said in that are on my website. So try it. Uh, and now People Speaking has these 53 extracts, and there are sound files so you can listen to all of them. Now, the first 22 are not only got the sound, but they've got the words used. Uh, the words were read by the, the actors. And by the way, I didn't tell them to uh, make it clearer than usual, to be, you know, e easy for people who didn't have English or native language. I said, you do it as you wish. And then when I heard them do about eight or ten of them, I said, yes, that was very nice indeed. But it didn't sound quite natural enough for me. And you could make it more natural the way you will ordinarily speak. And from then on, they, they were very close to you. They took that into account. And they spoke very naturally. And were much harder to understand. Right? <laughs> but then, anyway, that's good for you. I mean, when you find something that's hard to understand, you can play it over and over again. And it increases your understanding. It helps you, you improve your understanding. So that was people speaking. And then, uh, number two, and we might come back to this as well. I don't, I don't have decided to see how time goes. But that's all about limericks. And there are there, uh, well, I have limericks, I don't know if you know them. Uh, uh, it's a, a very popular form of, pr of verse, right? Not poetry, it's not, not literature. They're <coughs> jokey things. They're silly stories, if you like, about funny people. And uh, I, I have this sort of uh, itch to write them. But, but what's so good about them? They are in very, very regular rhythms. And uh, I do find in some textbooks used, written by various people that they do quote limericks. I know that, that Michael is going to be, if you haven't done it already, will be quoting at least one limerick to you, uh, uh, if not more. But uh, what I'll be very careful about these limericks is to write them so that they come out naturally. You see, the, the limericks I often find in um, in books that other people have written, tend to uh, retain old-fashioned words that you don't want to know. Right? So I've rewritten these. They are copies of other people's limericks very often. I've rewritten them if need be, if I haven't invented them myself. I've rewritten them so that they are in the most natural patterns as far as possible. But saying them would be very good practice for you in English rhythm. But they all expand, they all have the kind of beats and places you get in conversation language. Anyway, I commend those to you. I hope you'll find, uh, if we don't get back to it, uh, I'll try and get back and, and demonstrate one to, to you. But I wanted to go on for, uh, to the next section and then I'll really begin what I was going to talk about. So, little um, yeah, They all begin like there was an old man who, you know, whatever it is. And you probably know them. Anyway, I hope to come back. So now, what's the next three? Well, ah, now, this, this is interesting. I've been looking forward to doing this because, you know, as I say, I've done this course for 21 years. I retired from Leeds University. Well, I was in the Department of Phonetics and Linguistics there. Um, and uh, I did kind of work through here. And uh, when, I, when I was there, I... Uh, well, when I finished there, John Wells came to me and said, oh, so you finished there, how would you like to come on our summer court? I was I said, delighted. And I did. And then I came, and for 21 consecutive years I've done it. And this year I've resigned. <laughs> I've finished. Because I'm not, um, not in quite the good shape I was 25 years ago. You are walking about and things like that. That's why I'm sitting down now. I would much prefer to be standing, but I find it a bit painful if I did for the on to my condition. So, uh, now, one of the things I lectured for John on various occasions, up to as many as six in, in one course, and sometimes uh, often uh, fewer, and finally I was usually doing two lectures. Anyway, one of these lectures, not all of them, but one of them, had a part in it that the students complained about. The students, I think they, I don't know what exactly happened, I didn't care to ask them, but John said, I've had some serious complaints about your, your lecture on this, that 
had and I made fun of him once, he said, they say that you're laughing at them. But of course it was. We were all going to laugh at each other. If we're going to do phonetics, you can't keep your sense of humor. You, you need to laugh. But what do we do in phonetics? We all sit around saying funny words. <laughs> saying funny words that don't exist, or saying words in ways that, that uh, uh, imitate the way people do them wrongly, and people do them rightly, and so on. Uh, so you've got to have a sense of humor in phonetics. But anyway, John said, I found this little deputation. You've upset some people. So okay, I'll leave it out in future. Right? So ever since, I've left it out. But I've always remembered it because I thought, well, those students, and I don't think there were many of them, but they were vocal, you know, they expressed themselves to him. And he quite rightly wasn't taking any chances of offending anybody else. Now, I don't care this afternoon who I offend, okay? <laughs> Um, I'm good. I call this, and um, you can see it, I think, up on there, can't you? In number four, uh, to number three is suggestionism, a band lecture. So I'm going to tell you about that lecture that I gave that, that, that produced shock and horror on the part of some, some, some students. Anyway, now suggestionism is a word I invented myself. There's another word that I don't like, but it's all right to use, it's called non degree. That's, that's, that's nothing. Suggestion doesn't mean something. And what it means is this, that if you speak in a foreign language, like it's foreign to you, right? Uh, if you speak in a language that means it's not your native language, you're bound to make some mistakes. We all do when we speak in a language that's not our own, and we learn to avoid those mistakes. That's the process of, of the kind of instruction you get here. Uh, but what happens is, when you don't get something quite right, you almost inevitably, from time to time, you produce something that seems to mean what you want to say, but isn't. In other words, you sound as if you were, were are saying something you didn't want to say. And, of course, it may well be that what you actually said is ridiculous, is funny to people. Well, too bad. But actually the process of learning to speak a language well is a process of, of avoiding being funny. And perhaps not very funny, but not only funny, but at least entertaining, right? Um, so let's have a look at. We're going to now to. Yeah, we've gone. We're inside number number three now. We're going to look at the semitones. Now I'm going to have to go very quickly past this first couple of paragraphs, but I'll tell you what's in there. Um, uh, when John said, "Don't do not that, please," ask me. To avoid that content again, and I said, right, I'll drop, drop that. Uh, I thought to myself, well, I didn't say anything very nasty. I didn't tell them any wicked words, any bad words they should know, should use. I didn't tell them the most obscene words in the English language, right? I could have. And if I'd done that, well, I would be not surprised that people were shocked. But actually, this next paragraph, I'm not going to say it to you, and I'm not going to show it to you, this paragraph. Rob does mention uh, really naughty words, bad words you shouldn't use. And I hope if you do accidentally read about them, forget them afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll give you just one example. And this is an example of Ben Gay, actually. He, he talked about, he said, about Dutch people devoice to be at the end of the word crab when they're saying, they're trying to lead to a gap. But instead of saying crab, they say crap. So the fact is, crap is a very common English word, and it's not a polite one. It's a naughty one. It's a taboo word you shouldn't use, right? Well, if you can get away with it, using it, but don't. If you think the persons you're speaking to might be too sensitive. And so again, Bev gave the beautiful example of the Dutch student who talked about crap sandwiches. <laughs> and you know, crap is what goes in your mouth and comes out fairly solid. <laughs> Now, the other two words there that are dealt with in this paragraph also are the two worst words in this you must never say. Try not even to think of them. I, I try to think of them, not to think of them. But anyway, they are, I don't have to. But you can read it if you like, and you'll be fine. So I'm going on a little further. Yes? Keep, keep going. Oh, no. In the same? Yeah. That's right, let's go past that. Yes, 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 we'll, we'll go past that, yes, that's very naughty. Three, it's okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. 
Uh, yes, all right, yes. Um, um, rather old fashioned bit of stroke there, the, the, um, the eight o'clock joke. No, the eight o'clock joke? The, the man uh, uh, who, uh, uh, an Englishman, who went to a hotel in, uh, in New York and uh, he asked for a, um, an 8 a.m. call. And uh, just before 8 in the morning, he suddenly woke up, picked up the phone, and the woman at the uh, other end said, it's 8 o'clock, it's 8 o'clock. And he didn't know any before anybody called 8 o'clock. Right? <laughs> so as he didn't know anybody, he just put the phone down. He didn't realize she was telling him it's 8 o'clock. There's a difference, isn't there? So now, uh, this uh, first paragraph, this paragraph three, explains that type of thing where people have quite complicated names. So it's easy to say, try and say one name and find you're saying a different name. And uh, I've got one or two examples. Can we, can we um, go down, please? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the first set I mentioned uh, was Indian R. Now there only there's only one common word in the English language. An awful lot of words ending with schwa, right? There's only one word that you could either say it ending with schwa or with R. And that's the word cinema. You can either say cinema or cinema, right? <coughs> a lot of people say the latter, but uh, a lot of people say the other. Now, one I've got here examples of the fact that that is a, a matter not realized by many non-native speakers of English. Learners of English, they see the letter A and they want to pronounce it R every time and it isn't suitable. And I've given you some examples of what they accidentally say. For instance, they want to say Africa and they say Africa. Right? They want to say Africa, they say Africa. And uh, can, you, can you read them? Can you see them? And uh, um, they want to say American, they say America. That sounds like a happy moment. <laughs> America, or America. Um, and they want to say Asia, and they say Asia. And that sounds like the king of Persia, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and they want to say Jamaica, they say Jamaica. And well, what sound what kind is, is that? So we've got that sort of thing. And the, the prime example of that is the way people want to say the word Russia. And we pronounce the word Russia uh, with a schwa here. But a lot of people learning English see the A at the end and they want to call it Russia. And do you know what Russia means in English? Well, we're at it now. From four o'clock or early in the afternoon, everybody's hurrying back and forth, back from work. And it's the rush hour. But, but now, here's the, the trick, you see. Although we, you can say the word hour like that very carefully if you want to, although a lot of us just simply say ah. Oh. But you can say that when it doesn't sound bad English or doesn't sound abnormal. But if you say uh, rush hour, rush hour, well oh, that sounds funny to me. I, I don't hear any native speakers saying it that way normally. So they, what do they say? Well, because this word hour is too long in an unstressed syllable, they smooth it out into R. So let's talk about rush hour. See, uh, I, I'm hurrying now because the rush hour is beginning. So that's some examples ending in R. Now we've got some, to go on to the next paragraph, please. Yeah, and now we've got a set of names. And these names, uh, you see, they have, and I, I mentioned something at the very beginning, like Ella, Emma, Jessica, and Julia. And I see what happens when people uh, so sort of mismanaged days. They, if they want to say, for instance, L. R. Fitzgerald, right? This is my first example. That's a that's the name of a famous writer. And if you say L. R. Fitzgerald, um, and you really mean that famous black lady who sang so well, right? Then you better better not say L. R. Fitzgerald because they will think it, they're talking about this this writer. And the same with Emma Bovary. Well, if you want to talk about Emma Bovary, that's the name of this French uh, heroine, the French novel's heroine, you've got not to say Emma, but Emma, right? Same as you've got not to say Jessica um, as Jessica, because there are people with names like Carl Jones in English, and because if you say Jessica Jones, they'll catch your people a picture. Um, uh, so they are. Those are my, my main examples there. Oh, I'll give one other there. Uh, 
children often have little things to say that reflect um, oddities of our speech. And for instance, some people, very pedantic people, who uh, imagine they're speaking very clearly, supernaturally clearly, prefer to say not dogma, but dogma. Right? <laughs> and of course, any child would, would be delighted to say, do you mean our dogs, our lady dogs, of, uh, offspring? Are you talking about a mother dog, dogma? <laughs> so, are we going on? Oh, then I've got a few. Uh, again, we must go to the uh, thing of the south. Uh, see what happens to a word of accommodation. Now, this kind of word, uh, people want to, uh, instead of saying accommodation, they, they want to make too much of the first syllable. So instead of saying accommodation, they say accommodation. And uh, they produce all sorts of little sentences that seem to mean something, like, and anticipation and so on. And uh, they sound like something you don't intend to say. So we've got to be careful of that type of thing. Okay, we're going to go on. <coughs> There's more there you to talk. And now here's a set, and one of course we must have the first one. What happens <laughs> if, if you, instead of pronouncing Daniel the way it should be pronounced, the way Daniel Jones, the revered founder of this department, said it himself, if you don't call him Daniel, but you call him Daniel, because you see in the end, well, you'll be sounding if you're saying the wrong thing. In fact, I, uh, I think, perhaps I imagined it, I think I heard some uh, reference to a woman called Danielle Jones, right? Her name was Danielle. She had the French form of Danielle. Uh, anyway, this is what, if you do not pronounce that ending correctly, you'll see to say what my second one is there. And there's Steve N. Jones, is there Steve Jones? Yeah. Or, well, the, the family charity, yeah, the word familiarity in terms of talking about some family. Okay, we'll go on. Get the Lord slowly on. I won't do all of those, some of them are naughty actually. Yeah. Should we go on? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, well, now here are parodies, if you like, about the way people spoke to me. How do you do? You know, and Buddha is way one landlord. Good afternoon, or good afternoon, or good evening, good evening. Now, good evening would be a reference to a person. You know, the piece, there are some people called in, there's a people called Ven, and some people have both of them. Then their surname is Venning. I mean, goody is an old fashioned word for a grandmother or some nice lady or something. So, good evening, you can be a picture of Elizabethan English. It doesn't sound like good evening. So, that's the type of thing. And there's uh, Ella Venacrook, that's another thing. Ella Venacrook, Venacrook is your second. But the person says that means say Ella Venacrook. But they're not saying it. They're saying some funny name or something like that. Right, we go. Oh, yes, and warnings about short things and so on. Apple, don't say apple juice or orange juice, say apple juice. The sound is going to make a racial remark. Say apple juice. Uh, and, uh, Oh well. Yes. Uh, actually, the other day, one in one of John um, John Wells's uh, uh, blogs, he had an aside saying, "Now Jack Lewis will be very pleased this morning because I just heard of a new appointment to somebody on the staff of the BBC. She's a producer or something, and her first name is Joe, and her second name is King. Right? So her name is Joe King. <laughs> the funny thing about that is that what." People who haven't learned the right reductions of the vowel O, it's what they call pre force clipping in the department. In other words, you make the O shorter in the word joke than you make it in the word Joe, right? And instead of saying joking, they're saying joking, which sounds exactly like the name. In fact, we have a whole, hand, whole family of people called, called Joe, called King, sorry. And here's some of the others of them, right? There's Ho Ping, the optimistic Chinaman. See that one? Yeah. And anyway, uh, holding uh, the Sea King, well, we've got Sea King helicopters. So that's a different word of understanding. Uh, and there's Sea Link, we've got put the K in there. Sea Link, that's another one. Uh, and marking, now here's, here's the family. Marking what people do, uh, teachers do to people's work. And so in the family of the kings, we've got marking, Mars, a familiar word to mother, right? 
and you've got parking, part the father, parking of course is what you do when you want to put your car somewhere, right? Parking. So you not to pronounce it parking, but parking. Very slight difference. And then you've got the rest of the family. Baby Lee is Deakin. Deakin, rather. Yes. And Comedian Joe is joking, yes. Gardener Ray is raking, that's what you do in gardening, rake the earth, yes. And counterfeiter Faye, she's faking, faking. And creative May is making, and Scandinavian cousin is viking. <laughs> and then we've got various examples here, but I'm not going to uh, go into many of them. Uh, they are various things uh, that are examples of getting similar things wrong. We go a little bit. Yes. Yeah, well, these are quite, they're not very amusing, but they're quite important. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just take one or two of them. If we start with this section 12, um, I've got this it's a nice example of a tanker at anchor, for instance. A tanker at anchor. That, this could be a picture of a tanker, a ship that carries all the way around, at anchor, with the anchor dropped. Right? But if you say it and you don't use the right rhythm, you say you seem to say a tanker a tanker, say a, a tanker twice, a ship twice, or you, if you say a tanker a, a, a tanker, um, well, and you get wrong. Oh yes, the next one, a potato clock. Now I have a picture to read, and I must put it in my, my website. Pictures. Do you know you could have a clock made from a potato? Well, you will have a little like, electronic display and a, a wire at the end of it. And this piece of wire, sort of electrode, whatever you call it, you stick it into the potato or in, on a pear, you know, something, and it produces an electric current. And that electric current will drive the, the clock. So you can say, and then of course, this is a message here to people who want to say, not I get up at 8 o'clock, but I get up potato clock. If they say potato like that, instead of at, up at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock rather, uh, then they're going to have that sort of uh, problem. Right. Let's keep going, please. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we've got lots of examples of various things. Uh, there's a nice one here about British children and a playground riddle. Now, I'll ask you the riddle if you like, but there are the answer there already. In the playgrounds of England, children are fond of asking each other, why is a short Negro like a white man? Why is a short Negro like a white man? And the answer is, is he not at all black? Right? Now, we, we do call, these days, we, we don't call them niggers, but we do call them blacks, right? We put both of them, to my mind, are rather offensive way of referring to them. I, I prefer to call them, well, I don't use colored gentlemen, because that goes too far the other way. But I call them black men. But uh, anyway, uh, this, this is obviously, children notice that the word at all, and I say the word, because I think of it as one word, and I'd rather we wrote it as one word when we use it this way. It's a, it's a negative uh, item, it's a, a negative intensifier. Uh, we don't say, not simply not, but we say not at all. Uh, and we don't say just never, we say never at all. And the at and the all have coalesced there. They become one word. And how do you know? Well, because if the T of the at was the end of the word, and not the bit, end of the first word of two words, at and all, then it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be aspirated. But when we say not at all, we're aspirating that T. And aspirated T must be the beginning of a new sound. So at all should have had its spelling change in the early 18th century when this change came about. We've never done that. So, right. There are a few other silly ones coming up. Here's uh, Jack the Ripper, as I've heard some French people say, Jacques the Ripper. <laughs> uh, Jacques the Ripper. Uh, Frank Sinatra is Frank Sinatra. Um, uh, well, there's too many of these, really. Uh, so I shan't stay with them. Um, yeah. They're, they're all things that I seem to hear people say when they're trying to say the names of these famous people. So I think that's probably enough of that. We now we'll go back and, and try a limit, shall we? Go back to the word now. Yeah. 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 
Oh no, you've got to die. Sorry, I'm sorry. Before the day of the year. Before the day of the year. Uh, when I'm still. Yeah. Uh, the AFL Blue Tree practice with liberties. Now I commend this to you as good fun to try and say, and let's turn to the first one, please. Um, now, there are a couple of dozen of these to begin with, and they are. Now, here's the first one. Right. Now, they, we could actually put it in the sun, but I'll leave this first one. And notice the regular rhythm. A teacher called Stephen from Leeds eats each meal, eats each meal with a teaspoon of seeds. Lilies cling to his skin, thickets spring from his chin, and his knees are in leaf with green weeds. Now this is a very silly point, but it makes an important point. And it makes it like, now I'll tell, tell you something about the structure of limits. All limits, proper limits, have uh, two couplets and an odd. In other words, the first two lines must rhyme. And the next two lines must rhyme. And then the final line rhymes with the first two. So you can see that lead seeds only when you get past the couplet, short. And the couplet is always shorter than the, the main part. So that, that's one in which I've arranged for all the stressed syllables to demonstrate E. But all the, all the stressed syllables in the couplet, in the two short lines, demonstrate it. So there's a way of listening to, as I've seen for yourself, the contrast in E and it, in, which is a problem for many people. There's another one coming up, right? Yeah, all right, yeah. Uh, I'm jumping over one, and I'm taking one, the contrast at and um, air. The, that fat black cat, Nat from Rabat, sat passively flat on his mat. He never got wet, except for a bet, and it had to be massive at that. <laughs> Let's have another one. Oh yes, uh, this is about Sonia Hotchkiss Pops. You know that double battle thing. Sonia Hotchkiss Nops makes constant blots and spots. As she ought, of course, she feels awful remorse, but she'll obviously make lots that she wants. <laughs> I'll be going to skip this one. Yeah. All right, let's have a foolish group. This is contrasting, you can see we were contrasting <coughs> or up in the last one. Now we're contrasting ooh in the first and in the couple of them, oh, a very important contrast to get right in English. A foolish group tutor called Jude, when rebuked for being stupidly rude, said, I could, perhaps I should, be falsely good, but I'd sooner be brutishly crude. <laughs> so try those and listen to the contrast. You can play back to the sound file, if you've got that, perhaps you'll find one to play the sound file. Yes. No, keep going and tune one we have now so far. Can you go down? There are 22 of these, right? something about 22. Yeah, all right, look, there's, there's one, uh, there's a one contra there's contrasting er uh and uh, air, right? So can you click on, will clicking on the sound bar be enough? Yeah. You've got it? No sound? No sound can? Play, play arrow. Play arrow. Click on that. Well, not 
Yes. Yes, that's uh, the next one, which is number nine. It's a citizen of Hitchin called Binks. Now we're on the it again. We're contrasting it with E now in a different way around we did earlier. A little too given to drinks would eagerly greet who he'd beat in the street with sniggers and giggles and winks. <laughs> Yeah, well, but it was too bad to bring Greg any better. This is F, contracted with F again now. Benjamin Gregory Berry never drinks red wine or sherry, but giving, giving him whiskey is a little bit risky. He tends to get terribly dead. <laughs> <laughs> but notice, it's a very regular rhythm, it's a kind of rhythm people use. And if you can imitate that rhythm precisely, you're into the rhythm you need. You master very need for a lot of English sentences because although these are in, embedded in verse here, they can naturally come in conversation with some people. So let's go to the end of these then. 13 to your problem. Oh, yeah, this is a very famous one. Uh, but some of these I've taken from really naughty ones that clean them up. This is one of them. Um, where, where are we? Oh, no, we have. Uh, Yes, we got to that. Just let me back. Right here we are. A hot-blooded novice at John's. John stands at St. John's College, Cambridge. Right? A hot-blooded novice at John's was erotically fondling the swans. Well, make sport with my daughter, said a hoary old porter. But the swans are not off. They're the dogs. If you've got it. It's a very subtle one, rather naughty. So I, guess, I hope you didn't understand it. <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Go on, then. Yes. Uh, here's one. I wrote to say when I was teaching in Spain. And uh, this is one of them. An EFL teacher in a stewardess claimed qualifications that were spurious. But I say, what the hell? He taught perfectly well. And his lessons were in no way injurious. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to take my favourite one of all this time. But this is not contrasting art. It's just for fun to get a good English rhythm one. So, let's have can we show it to them? Now, here we are then. An amorous couple in Spain set about making love on a train. But their pleasure was marred because a tiresome guard, when they wouldn't refrain, pulled the chain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really out of time, but there's, there's plenty more of entertaining stuff in there. In there. I commend my my uh, Thank you very much. I think everybody agrees that that's a fitting ending to 21 years of teaching on the schedule. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>